Welcome everyone, this is Debbie Maver with National Kitchen and Bath Association. You're here for our third webinar of the month on outdoor living. Today's session is called Outdoor Man 2.0, Designing Your Next Kitchen or Bath Outside. Allie Mann is here with us. She is the senior designer with Case Design based in the Washington, Baltimore area. And I'd also like to just give a shout out to Blaze Outdoor Products for generously sponsoring today's session and all of our webinars this month. And Allie, we're ready to get started. Thank you so very much. Okay. Thank you, Debbie, uh, for having me. And thank you, everyone, for joining me today. Um, really happy you're here. Really excited to talk to you uh, about outdoor kitchens and bathrooms. And I'll tell you a little bit about myself in just a second. Full disclosure, when I get excited and really passionate about something, I tend to speak quicker and my voice it's a little pitchy. It's something I've been working on all my life. When I was little, my dad would say, Allie, I, I need you at a two and you're really at a 10. And so I'm hoping I give you like a six or seven today, but I'm going to watch the comments. So if you're like, hey, slow down, I can't understand what you're saying. I try to be really cognizant of my cadence. So I just want to tell you that because I just have so much information to share with you. Um, so that being said, this is Outdoor Man 2.0, and I call it 2.0 because I had an opportunity to um, speak about this last year at KBiz um, in Las Vegas, and there was a lot of great opportunities to talk about uh, the presentation with the products, with a lot of new stuff to market. We were seeing a lot of new design, so this is an updated version of that with a little more information on it, plus we've got a little COVID spin on it too. So... With that, uh, if you haven't met me before, hi, nice to see you. And let me tell you a little bit um, about myself. So I am an allied member of ASID. I'm CAPS certified through NAHB. I have my CKBR through NARI. I'm, of course, an NKB member, NKBA member, where y'all are here. I have a BFA in interior design from James Madison University, and I also teach at the college level too. So I have been an adjunct faculty member at Northern Virginia Community College here in the Baltimore, Washington area for the better part of 10 years. Um, I teach IDS 100 introduction to interior design, and I also teach IDS 130, which is a kitchen and bath course that I wrote for the university. So they're really happy to have that as well. Um, in 2019, I was featured on HGTV Flipper Flap Remix, which was a really cool thing to film and be a part of. And last April during COVID, I was named to the 40 under 40 class by a professional remodeler, remodeler, excuse me, magazine. But I really want to talk with you today about kitchens and bathrooms outdoor. It's not really a new design trend, but it is a big design trend and COVID's had a big impact on that. And we'll touch on that as well. This presentation today is going to cover and review current lifestyle trends that influence and promote the need for this type of outdoor living experience. We're going to classify key design elements to a successful outdoor kitchen and bathroom space, identify current features and styles for these spaces, and we're going to discuss appropriate materials to specify for these types of spaces as well. Okay, so I'm going to reference the DF DC market where I'm from because that's what I know. But forgive me, we're in, it's, it's, it's talking globally, but I just want to mention what we've been experiencing and impacting here. And perhaps that's something similar that you're experiencing in your hometown um, as well. So take the DC market where I am from. Um, Pre-COVID and of course during COVID, we have seen an increase in popularity in outdoor activities. This idea of promoting healthy lifestyles and wellness. Um, there's a picture in the middle right there of the wharf that's downtown on the Potomac River in DC, that's sort of this resurrection, reconstruction of that space that was otherwise an undesirable part of DC for the last 20 years prior to this transformation, which has really sort of celebrated being outdoors, which is really awesome. Um, and this idea that we have free activities left and right of us. And like I mentioned, pre-COVID, my family would enjoy um, going downtown. I have two um, younger girls, three and six, and we would enjoy having, um, you know, outdoor story time at the Sculpture Garden um, in D.C. So just this idea of being outside, connecting with nature, taking advantage of what your town, your city has to offer. We also have this notion idea too, that seasons seem to have blurred. Um, in DC, certainly 
we have summer that we recognize as being Memorial Day to Labor Day, but really folks are using their outdoor spaces really March till almost November before you have to winterize. I mean, just last weekend, it was so nice here. Um, my family was outside enjoying our fire pit. So this idea that you can um, lengthen that um, time that you are outdoor, really able to enjoy that space. And again, that view, this iconic view. So this is patriotic. This is the 4th of July, summertime, Washington, DC. So if you're in and around this area, Everyone wants to celebrate that view. How are you celebrating it? Um, folks that live on the waterfront or in DC or in Arlington even, the district, they're looking to take advantage of this and everyone wants to host or have that 4th of July party. Um, if you are in Alexandria, perhaps you live close to Reagan Airport. Again, this is just what my folks do. Um, they like to watch the planes um, come in and land. It's, it's really special, there's one runway that everyone takes off of and, and lands on. So watching planes is a thing here too. But this idea that you want to celebrate this view and, and be outside, and even though we're in the midst of a pandemic, these outdoor spaces that we're creating and encouraging give folks this luxury to gather, but feel safe and socially distant as well. So that's been something folks are, are really interested in. I mentioned that view. Here's a picture of an Alexandria rooftop deck um, in Old Town, right there in the heart of things, a hustling, bustling um, area. But then here you see this kind of juxtaposition with um, an outdoor space, a, a backyard, uh, an outdoor kitchen area on, on a patio setting. And we talk about this inherent need for nature. So you're connecting with friends and family outside, but you're connecting with nature. I think I mentioned in the IDS 100 class that I teach and I'm teaching it virtually uh, right now, remotely this semester. I think we're going to meet in person next semester. But anyways, remote right now. The very first chapter, chapter one, is um, the value of interior design. And there's a common theme in that first chapter even, um, this idea, this need for nature. And there is a discussion question that goes on to explain um, the innate desire to spend time outdoors and how this desire relates to design and the spaces we create. And here we are. Um, again, this is one of the trending spaces for folks that was pre-pandemic, but certainly during the pandemic um, as well. And it's not just textbook material that is covering the subject. We see trends that are telling us these outdoor spaces are really to be celebrated and had and valued in shelter magazines like Remodeler Magazine. Here you can kind of see um, they're looking at the uh, backyard decks and patios are seeing a rise in the cost recoup sort of highlighted there. And I just sort of highlighted the DC market where I from showing that that trend is on the rise, which is a good thing. And then we also have um, from our friends at AIA, the um, American Institute of Architects, they are telling us that the popularity of outdoor spaces isn't anything new. It's actually been on the rise since 2012. So the better part of the last nine years, it's been trending in an upward direction. We have this other idea that Everybody is talking about it. Um, our industry shelter magazines, as I mentioned, wealth magazines, the web, social media, financial groups, cookbooks, designers, friends, influencers, celebrities. Everyone's talking, buzzing about these outdoor kitchens and bath spaces. Um, we were seeing a demand pre-COVID um, and that early stay at home order, that shelter in place that we were sort of asked to do roughly a year ago to help slow the spread only enhance the need and desire for this even more as folks were staying home. Um, their middle article right there um, from Forbes says coronavirus drives residential outdoor living demand and trends from um, writer Kate Bailey. She says um, that the pandemic made homeowners keenly aware of both their indoor and outdoor spaces. And she says that homeowners are investing more now that they're able to spend more time at home. And this time has allowed folks to reconnect with family and nature, uh, become possibly more active uh, or embrace an outdoor activity like gardening. And it's also funny to know that since we do everything on the internet, or social media these days, in as little as you know, five to 10 minutes, you could search outdoor kitchens and bathrooms on the internet. You could determine their popularity. You could decide that's something you wanna pursue and remodel or add to your home or design. You could check out options from a financial lender, institution, or bank on how you um, will pay for your next project. And then voila, you've pretty much figured out how you're going 
to add a kitchen or bath outdoors to your space with the exception of you need help with the design and the materials and of course someone to construct it and to you the designer and how you can be effective and really help your clients. Other thing I want to mention about that too is we have this rise in kitchens and bathrooms sort of parallel with that again especially where I'm from we saw a lot of um, pools and community spaces did not open last summer or if they did they opened late um, or with you know tons of restrictions, that sort of thing. But this idea that even um, our pool vendors, a lot of folks were saying, if I can't go to the pool where I've paid my membership, I'll build a pool in my backyard. And as a result, the um, the the pool industry, at least where I am, they, they're booked out two years. So if you thought you got on the list to have a pool built last year, you might have it built this summer. You might be waiting next summer. It's just seen that much of a surge as a result of the pandemic and folks staying at home, pent up demand for it. We're also seeing kitchens and bathrooms outdoor everywhere on, on prime time, totally in your face, right? So we have networks like HGTV and the DIY network, the cooking channel, the design network, some popular shows like Flipper Flop and Kitchen Crashers and Man Fire Food and Backyard Staycation. I'm certainly not naming all of them. And I would be remiss if I didn't even talk about all of the streaming services that have come to light in the last year featuring shows on remodeling outdoor spaces as a result of the pandemic. Perhaps they just had all these you know, shows just magically shelved waiting for an event like this. I don't really know, but we just seem inundated with them now. Um, you know, Netflix has their own design series and you know, Discovery and all the likes. Everyone's able to stream um, design shows on these outdoor spaces. And then there's this idea when you have this outdoor space, this outdoor kitchen or bathroom, it's this idea of experience. And so I've mentioned this before, but it's, it's just so funny how much it hits home. Um, and let me give you a little antidote. So this is a picture a photo of Jamie Drake. And Jamie Drake uh, is an amazing, a renowned um, interior designer. He resides in Manhattan, but his work is international. He's worked for the likes of Madonna and former uh, Mayor Michael Bloomberg. But in any event, I had the opportunity to see Jamie speak at an uh, industry show in the like latter part of the 2000s. So after we just had the housing bubble burst and the the shows were just kind of coming back on the scene, albeit they were smaller. This was in Chicago, but it wasn't nearly the magnitude it was a few years prior, and certainly not even on scale or on par with what we saw um, in Vegas last year for Cabbage, like a much smaller sort of outfit. But Jamie was there, he was speaking, and he was talking about experience. And this idea was that the recession we'd experienced then um, had folks holding on tight to their money, to their purse strings, folks um, having meals at home. Sounding familiar, guys? Um, folks not eating out. And as a result, we saw popular chain restaurants go away. But we also saw the rise of food trucks and specialty restaurants. We also saw Netflix come on the scene in 2010, so a little bit later. But this idea that Blockbuster was going to file for bankruptcy and people weren't going to rent or maybe go to the movies as frequently as they were. They were going to kind of stay in their home and really celebrate their home and that sort of experience. And it wasn't until, you know, later in the, in the teens, the 2000s, we, 2010s, we experienced that folks really started, you know, really traveling again and really feeling that that was okay and it was safe. And my, all these things just kind of sound familiar what we're doing now, you know, um, 10 years later or so. But this idea of experience, that's going to be like a popular theme. So experience, what could that mean with our outdoor kitchens and bathrooms? And especially how does that apply to the content now as opposed to a recession several years ago? Well, it's this idea about recreating those memories that were once far away from your home, having bringing them to your home, um, back to your castle, your domain, your cocoon, as likely many folks had to put off travel experiences they planned since last March. So things um, like reliving that shower experience from the latest spa trip to the to the Maldives, but that again probably a year ago because we weren't traveling so much. Um, if you want to enjoy dining al fresco like you did in your last vacation in Tuscany, Italy, you know now you can. If you just want to recreate your outdoor shower that you experienced at the at your beach house that you love so much, you can have an outdoor shower. It doesn't have to be at a beach or a lake house. It could be 
at your main residential sort of setting, you can have that too. Or something as simple as you want to enjoy, you know, uh, a wood fire pizza, uh, but in your backyard with your family and make it in three minutes and have a night of entertaining outside, you can do that too. This idea of bringing all those experiences you want celebrated outside your home to your home, part of that experience. And of course, there's a several other trending factors. Let's just hit on a couple of the big ones. So COVID fatigue now, right? We didn't have COVID, you know, a year ago, but now we have COVID fatigue. There is this pent up demand for, we've been looking at our four walls um, of our house, outside our house, our dwelling. We've, we've, we've resided there. We've sheltered in place. We haven't seen friends. We haven't seen family. We haven't traveled. How can we improve the four walls where we are doing all the things? Escapism, the idea that hanging out in our outdoor space is a form of escapism from the daily grind, from working at your kitchen table, from schooling your kids at home, all the things. Uh, evoking rejuvenation, perhaps that we've been missing that. There's a sense of that here and now. Perhaps an outdoor shower will give you that sense, that peace of mind that you kind of need to feel, again, with everything going on. Social media saturation. In a time where we feel so isolated, social media has made it possible for us to feel connected, but then perhaps, you know, maybe jealous and envious of the spaces others um, we see at the same time. So this need to sort of, you know, detox and turn it off. It's a good but a bad thing, a double-edged sword. A deeper sense of appreciation of our space. The, um, this experience the world has shared over the last year has really been humbling. I know for myself, I have never donated so much food as I have um, to shelters and food pantries in the, as I have in the last year. And it's been really humbling and something I don't think I'm going to turn off once the pandemic is over. It's going to remain with me. It's something I feel really passionate about. Um, but also this idea, this overwhelming sense of gratitude for all the good things that we have, kind of really looking inward and, and what that means. The influence of joy. It's so funny. Um, a year ago, right now, and I'm just going back to a year ago, kind of where were we before the world felt like it stopped? We were so like overbooked, overscheduled, right? And we were talking about JOMO. You're like, what the heck is JOMO? Um, it's the joy of missing out. How maybe you scheduled um, a coffee date with a friend and you called to say you couldn't make it, but secretly you were really happy that you couldn't make it because you just needed to take one thing off the books and you didn't know how to tell someone no. So we talked about the joy of missing out, but now this is the influence of joy. Where can we find joy and bring joy into our everyday lives? Again, just with everything we're experiencing and perhaps it's our outdoors. The sense of living a life well lived and this idea that we're all overworked and overstressed. And as I mentioned, we're doing a gazillion things all from our homes, things we were never you know, meant to do. The kitchen table was meant to eat. It wasn't meant to school your kid. It wasn't meant to do Zoom office meetings from nine to five. Just all these extra things now inside the house that have really blurred the lines of that work-life balance. And then this idea of seeking a more colorful full life of balance and wellness. How do we achieve that? How does that make more sense? How does that really hit home with everything going on? I threw this photo in here. It seemed very timely. Uh, we, this is Nate Burkus for Caesar Stone last year. He had an opportunity to speak about the outdoor countertop line he was working on with them. And here he is from last year's KBiz in Vegas. Um, in one of their outdoor kitchen vignettes that he said sort of curated. So he's talking about the countertops and what he sees as significant roles um, as kitchens are gonna be playing, outdoor kitchens, excuse me, um, kind of going forward. So now we've talked about some trending factors, little history, kind of how we got here. Before we talk about good design, the materials let's use, let's just take a few moments and look at a, a little sort of video montage of some outdoor spaces, outdoor kitchens in particular at first, sort of celebrating this experience idea.
Okay. So when we get to our outdoor kitchens, we'll talk about kitchens first, then we'll kind of come back to the bathrooms. Um, but this idea that every great design is going to start with a plan and how do we arrive at that plan? Well, we're going to want to um, start with our 2D and 3D drawings we're going to share with our clients. That's going to be sort of our landing board, our springboard for them. And then we're going to focus on this idea that the outdoor kitchen is going to be comprised of four zones. Candidly, there could be like three, um, but there's four zones. The first zone, the cooking zone area, the, the number two is the prep zone. Number three, plating and garnishing, but I think that could really be combined with number two, but we'll call it step three for the moment. And then um, step four, or space four, excuse me, um, the zone where you serve and entertain. That's the fun one, right? That's where everyone's coming over for. So in your cook zone, you want to be mindful of what you're cooking on. Most people would associate that with a grill. We'll talk about some other auxiliary accessories. But this idea, the primary focus is to think about the size of the grill when you're designing and where is it going to go. That's really the big takeaway. That's where everything's going to come out of. Where are you cooking? How are you cooking? So this idea that your grill could be 30, 36, 42, 48, or 54 inches, something along those lines. Figure out your grill size. Then you need to figure out What's it going to sit in? What's it going to rest in? Is it going to be on a cart? Is it going to be built in? Um, are you going to use propane or natural gas? You know, both can have lines plumbed to the grill, though candidly, the propane will burn hotter than the natural gas. So sometimes it's preferred by true sort of chefs or, you know, food connoisseurs. But what, what are you going to do with that? And if you're going to have a grill, are you going to need other cooking accessories? Are you going to need a separate burner for sauteing, for steaming, for frying, for pasta cooking? All these things we could do in the kitchen, but this idea of this experience, right? Um, we're staying at home, but we're going to bring the inside out. So often we're trying to bring the outside in. Here we're bringing the inside out. And also I point out that because um, home outdoor entertaining is becoming increasingly popular, a lot of big box stores like Williams Sonoma are beginning to sell some of these accessories for less. You don't have to necessarily buy them from an appliance manufacturer. Um, you can get them from a big box store, perhaps. Maybe it's not a totally well-known name brand, but you can get it for a fraction of the price, um, which might be appealing to some folks. Then we have... Um, the cooking zone continued, right? We talk about this idea that maybe if you're adding a grill, maybe it's not a grill. Maybe it's a pizza oven that cooks the perfect pizza in three minutes, as I sort of talked about before. It can be built in. It can sit on the counter or at the very basic on a prep cart. I mean, so a, a pizza oven can go a number of places. That could be a nice sort of auxiliary accessory you're adding. Do you need a commercial wok or tempanyaki griddle, um, perhaps a smoker or charcoal griddle? Again, kind of bringing those restaurant type experiences to your home, to your outdoor space. So once you've sorted out your cooking needs, that's the first and foremost, right? Then depending upon what you're doing, you may or may not need um, additional ventilation. And I say that because if you're going to put your cooking feature um, under a structure that has a roof of some sort, you are going to need to add ventilation. Candidly, it's not my favorite look. Ventilation outside seems kind of like a misnomer to me, but very, very important nonetheless. So if you're doing anything under roof, you are going to need to add proper ventilation over your grill to avoid fires and things like that. So that was sort of zone number one, the cooking zone. Now we're gonna talk about the prep zone. Um, once we establish the cooking zone, we need to think about what the prep zone includes. And for us, that could be pantry storage that's outdoors, refrigeration that's outdoors too, um, outdoor trash, sink or prep or something with a waste chute. Maybe it's an outdoor ice maker, um, maybe a mini fridge or dishwasher. And just a note about that too, you really should be specking if it's, um, if it's a dishwasher uh, or an ice maker or a fridge, those should be rated for the outside. It's not ideal to put an indoor refrigeration in an outdoor setting. You want to be mindful of that. It's not as simple as taking your dishwasher from your kitchen and putting it in an outdoor setting now. And you also want to remember that if you live in a climate that gets below freezing temps like we do here, um, you have to winterize those water items. 
So that's something to think about too. So that's our prep zone. All those features can belong there and live there. And then the third zone, that plating and garnishing, as I mentioned, that could possibly be combined with, um, with step two, the prep zone, but plating and garnishing um, is an optional zone. And perhaps plating and garnishing um, lives in the corner of a staged um, cooking area, possibly near the seating, but it's not quite entertaining, but it's not quite cooking, but it's not quite your prep. It's almost somewhere in between. If you have room for it, sometimes some of our smaller outdoor spaces, they don't have all this space. So it's perfectly okay to combine zones two and three if that's what the space requires. But if you could identify them as something separate, that would be helpful as well and good for, for your client if you have the room. Then you're going to serve and entertain. That's the fun part, right? That's why everybody came over. They came over, you know, to kind of talk to you um, and converse while you're grilling, that sort of thing. But this is where we're going to celebrate food to table um, and just sort of relax and, and recharge. And when we're, when we're serving and entertaining, perhaps we've included um, perhaps a fire feature, perhaps it's an actual built-in outdoor fire. Maybe it's the fire pit or table. Those are wildly popular right now, too. It's this idea that it's a little bit more than just bringing the meal to the table or having a drink. What else are we doing to entertain and unwind in that space? Next, we want to think about materials. We've talked about the design and the layout, but what sort of materials um, sort of sort of help uh, in, enhance that design, right? And one thing would be the grill. What's it going to sit in, right? So your grill excuse me, could sit in um, in a base cabinet. And if it's not in a base cabinet per se, perhaps it's in a, um, a framed application that's then finished with an applied brick or stone veneer or stucco look even. And when you're designing this concept, it's important that you have properly measured that storage space or unit below your grill. Um, so the face frame and doors um, accurately fit in the opening. If you're doing something like you can kind of see here, a lot of these applications, they have some type of storage below the grill. You want to make sure, you know, you, you measure twice, you, you cut once, or in this case, I guess, build once. But this idea that you need to thoughtfully measure what you're going to be doing there if you're not just putting it straight into a cabinet, if you're putting it um, more in a custom setting like a brick or a stone veneer or stucco application even. And if you're not going that route, Perhaps you're doing something more traditional like cabinetry. Perhaps when people think of outdoor kitchens, they might think of cabinets. And I just would make mention, it's not as simple again as taking cabinets from the kitchen, placing them outside. You should be looking at an outdoor line of cabinetry that you're considering um, for this space. Now, it's not to say you can't rule out the indoor cabinets completely if you are potentially under roof or in a breezeway or you live in an area where you don't have those wide sort of swings um, of climate and seasons basically like we do here. Um, but the idea is best to use an outdoor cabinet, a cabinet that's rated for the outside. When we think of those, what first comes to mind for many might be a version of a stainless cabinet. So some stainless cabinetry, but if we're not doing um, a stainless cabinet, perhaps you're doing a wood like a teak or a cypress that's rated for the outside. And typically those are gonna be um, like a, 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 a stain in place application. So you'll usually come to you unfinished and then you are going to um, stain, pick the stain um, yourself with the homeowner on site, which is kind of fun too. So you can kind of really pull all your finishes together, like perhaps your decking material, your countertop, everything. So it ties together. There's a company called NatureCast. Um, that's what a couple of these photos are in here. And I think they're revolutionizing the look of outdoor cabinets. I last got to see them in KBiz um, last year. And they make a phenomenal cabinet with so many um, options in terms of finishes and material. But the idea is that they make these cabinets out of a special resin um, and PVC material that claims their product is weatherproof. And they give a real wood look feel that they even go so far as to cast all their doors and molds in a um, in a, um, in, in a real distressed um, cypress. So it kind of has that textured um, wood element to it that a lot of people like, which is really nice. Um, what was I gonna say, excuse me. That is the, the, should be the nature cast is that upper, upper left picture. Excuse me, I wanna make sure I tell you that correctly. The upper right picture 
is a teak cabinetry setting. So that's an example of some teak cabinetry there. The lower um, right is powder coated stainless steel from um, Brown Jordan. Many of you might be familiar with them. They do outdoor furniture. They also do an outdoor cabinet line too. And um, then there's just another variation of a more um, traditional outdoor cabinet stainless door from perhaps maybe one of many of the cab manufacturers that, that you work with a little bit more standard. Um, and sorry, I was reading the comments here a second. So the cabinets are that I was referencing are it's called nature, nature cast. Um, I can put that in chat later, but it's nature cast. Um, they do a really great, they do a really great job um, with their product and give you more information on that later. Nature cast. There we go. Yes. Um, so those are those are the cabinets. That's where your plumbing and or your cooking is going to sit and live, right? It's going to support your countertops. And then for your countertops, we think most nearly um, your fabricators will probably try to push you in the direction of granites and soapstones that are going to hold up very nicely. And they're going to withstand the outdoor elements. Um, but other great selections for countertops include neolith, decton, and porcelain. I say buyer beware on porcelain, though. It may not fare so well in extreme temperature swings like we experience in Washington, D.C., though it will hold up just fine in other regions. So depending upon where you are, take that into consideration. Um, what was I going to say? Also, I mentioned the Caesar stone that just came onto the market. That was really last June when it, we really started to see it. And those are countertops. Caesar stone makes a line. They have a a dozen, half dozen colors or so that can be used outside too, in fact. So now bringing that quartz material outside. Quartz wasn't thought to be a good application for an exterior product, not because of the strength and durability, but because of the ability for fade resistance if left in like really heavy sunlight. And according to Caesar Stone, they've tackled that. So they they say that they've They've, um, they've worked really hard on that sort of the, the UV light that will penetrate their quartz. And so it's not gonna fade over time. Again, here's some more examples of countertop materials. So Decton and Neolith, we see more commonly in commercial um, applications um, and residential applications. We even see wall cladding with this. So countertops to be cladded in a Neolith or Decton material would, would certainly withstand the elements outside. And as I mentioned, the quartz is kind of iffy because of the exposure to the UV light. So some manufacturers like Caesar Stone have come out with their version of something that's rated for the outdoor space, but not everyone will tell you that their product is meant to go outside. So you want to be mindful of that when you're selecting things like countertops. And speaking of being outside, right, the idea of the UV light, um, we talk about this idea to shade or not to shade, right? Is that even a possibility depending upon where you're putting this outdoor kitchen or bathroom, although we're speaking about the outdoor kitchens right now. So you definitely wanna consider the prolonged um, exposure to natural light all the time. Um, is it going to be shaded by some trees or some other article or some object? You've seen those overhangs and umbrellas. Um, will you be designing in a covered area or a pergola? Or did you know that, you know, Trex, just to go with your decking, they sell no maintenance pergola kits, for example. What is this setting? Where is, where is this going to be? If this is on a rooftop deck, as we do so many of those in the DC area, you might have, you know, an oversized sort of pivoting or rotating umbrella, you know, maybe on a swing arm that you could maneuver when you need it to be in the shade. Um, if you're cooking versus when you're sitting, maybe something like that, because you're not necessarily going to get that tree factor if you're sort of high up um, in a rooftop deck setting. So just thinking about what you, what, what you're going to need in terms of shade. I laughed at this next slide. So I was reviewing the shade idea with um, our vice president, Bill, here. And Bill was particularly interested in shading and my thoughts on that. And he said, I don't know if he meant to say it, but he said, how about a retractable awning alley? And all I could think of was, ew, no. And I thought of Sunsetter from like the 1980s and the retractable awnings and how hideous I thought they looked. My apologies if anyone has someone or thinks they're awesome. I mean, no offense. Um, but this idea that that was not how I would be thinking I would be shading my maybe luxury outdoor kitchen, but they make some more modified, some more attractive looking retractable awnings now. 
which are a big improvement from those days of Sunsetter and those infomercials. Um, and again, a, a pergola would be would be something nice nice too if you have the space and opportunity to to build something like that. But some sort of retractable application might be in the cards, maybe more budget friendly, maybe a cost savings than going to the extent of building a pergola. Not entirely sure, but some options, right? If you're looking for that shaded feature. I know someone had asked a little bit about um, plumbing materials and sinks. So I wanna talk about that a little bit. Interesting when I was doing my research and as I've also been um, doing a lot of outdoor kitchens right now, it's actually funny from the view of where I did one of my very first rooftop decks um, in Arlington, because I mentioned the great view of the fireworks. Um, another house, a couple doors down or up, however you want to describe it, um, he wanted a rooftop deck too. As I mentioned, there's all these sort of these, 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 these high-rise applications or these five-story townhomes. And just in saying that though, it's funny because we were over there measuring the other day. We are building it for him right now. It's got to be completed before the 4th of July. Gee, I mean, that's a milestone people like. Um, but it was funny because we were pointing to the other project we completed from his roof. And I had to laugh. I'm like, oh, do you know so-and-so? Because we had done that piece too. It was kind of funny. Um, but in any event, not all manufacturers have outdoor plumbing. Um, an example, Kohler, one of the biggest names out there, they have nothing rated for the outdoors. And guess what? They don't plan to. I was really disappointed. I was talking to my rep, um, Evan and Chris, and I was like, guys, you're missing like a huge segment of the market. And they're like, no, we're just not interested in it. I said, okay. So you could use their product for the outside, but they're not rated. Not a single thing is rated for outdoor use. I don't know if that's a risk I would want to take. I would want to pick something that is rated for outdoor use. So some vendors um, like Moen, they make outdoor rated beverage faucets and LK will make some sinks, excuse me, some sinks. But the route I have been going is using um, those materials, specking those materials or accessories as they're called from my outdoor appliance vendors who just focus on outdoor appliances. So you saw the, I guess, the advertisement from, from Blaze earlier. They make a cocktail station um, with a sink and a faucet. It's very attractive. It's meant for entertaining. And I think that folks in that outdoor appliance world really have hit the nail on the head and they are able to produce attractive faucets and sinks for that entertainment element, which some of our indoor plumbing fixtures aren't so keen on. So that's what I've been doing. So I mentioned Blaze, um, but also Alfresco and Lynx. They make really good cocktail stations and um and outdoor faucets too and then there's more out there i'm just naming a few i'm probably not supposed to but i've had great success with them and again they also sell that grilling um, application and cooking accessories too okay so then after you kind of thought about the design and the layout and if you're using cabinets or if you're going to build it in, you know, into um, build your appliances and and um, and plumbing into, excuse me, into a, a brick or, or a stucco or, or um, a stone veneer, you, you know, you've got your plumbing figured out. What, what is it going to sit on? What is this kitchen sitting on? And a couple things come to mind, right? So it could be on a patio, as you see some example here. It could be on a patio surface of brick or natural stone or porcelain pavers. That's sort of one idea that comes to mind. It could be on a deck. Um, you could have this outdoor kitchen on a deck. If the outdoor kitchen is on a deck, that deck is either going to be real wood or a wood composite. And that's something you want to think about, whether this is, you know, new construction you're working with with your client or whether it's a remodeled or an addition or an enhancement to an existing deck. You want to be really mindful that it can support the weight and load of the materials you're specking and also the folks that are going to gather there. Um, and so, if you're not aware of that, that's something generally your contractor, y'all, you know, working with them, um, you could, um, they could add structure support for it. If you're, if you're adding these pieces or element to an existing deck, if you're building new, of course, it'll be engineered appropriately. But if you're adding to, you can still modify it within reason. It could be on a rooftop application. So we've said patio, we've said deck, 
perhaps it's a rooftop. If it's a rooftop application, um, the material underfoot is a far greater consideration due to the more harsher and prolonged um, exposure to the elements. You wanna check to make sure that, that materials warranty includes a rooftop application. That could be a non-starter right there. And you wanna ensure appropriate working conditions um, working considerations, excuse me. How are you going to get your materials up to what might be a sixth floor? Do you need a crane? Do you have to use that crane more than once? If you're using a crane, um, do you need a special permit? Do you have to shut down streets? Do you have to um, alert neighbors? Just several things to think about behind the scenes in design that are all part of it and play a huge role, but something people don't talk about so often. Um, when we use our cranes, typically we do one load to get up the decking material and the majority of the cabinets. And then the second crane trip might be then to get the furniture uh, and the countertops and some accessories or enhancements up. Typically these rooftop applications, there is an elevator, but I guess, of course you cannot get these materials inside the elevator. So a crane is necessary. Um, so just think about things uh, like that. that. They also provide an advantage, I think, when you're looking to plumb something on a rooftop deck. Um, usually, these rooftop applications, the kitchen is a little bit closer to that roof in many instances than you might think. Like if you think of like a beach house and you're capturing the view of the beach of the ocean, typically the kitchen's not on the ground floor in a beach house. Typically it's elevated to a second or third floor. So you could maximize that view with the kitchen or deck space. I mentioned in DC, we do a lot of rooftop applications. So people are looking to maintain that view in their rooftop deck, but also in their kitchen and living rooms, which would be situated directly under this rooftop deck so we can tie into those plumbing and drain lines, which is a, a plus. It's been a big plus when we've been doing these, these installations. So you want to think about how are you going to how are you going to drain if you're doing um, you know, a, a sink, where are your plumbing lines, what's your access to them if you're doing a rooftop application. You want to certainly think about this for a patio or for a deck, but the roof especially too, where the water is coming down um, and maybe into your home, um, as opposed to maybe more directly away from it, um, in fact, too. This is just a little video of um, our case team, one of our last installations uh, right outside DC. This is the, the cladding for that knee wall you see coming up. So we had to get the decking down first, get the stainless steel cabinets set that are rated for the exterior, and then bring up the, the rest of the material to sort of clad that knee wall there you see. And other considerations that are important are gonna be lighting. So. Of course, the sun's going to go down at some point. You want the party to continue, whether it's you or your family, you know, your closest 20 friends, socially distanced, whatever the case may be. Um, but this idea that perhaps you have task lighting at the grill, perhaps you have ambient lighting for entertaining, you know, that soft glow. If it's a little dark, it's at sunset. Um, possible under counter lighting to navigate um, if you have a step or transition in height um, for your spaces and appliances. Maybe you need a little under cabinet lighting to see what's going on with your appliances there. So so different things uh, to consider when it comes to lighting, um, especially your kitchen space. So some general tips to consider for the perfect outdoor kitchen space. Um, this is just my short list and there's no particular order, but um, number one is their prevailing wind direction, if any, that might come into play in the factor. What's the ideal location for that outdoor kitchen, given your setting, given your circumstances, what you're working with, um, the seating, Ideally, like literally the seating should never be positioned on the back side of the grill. That's just not an ideal location. What's the orientation to the sun? You know, how, how does that exposure sort of um, help and play a role in the design you're working on? Um, what is the ideal number to host a minimum and a max that's comfortable? What can your space accommodate on both ends of that spectrum? Are there utilities available and how hard are they to get to or access? So your gas, water, your propane, your electric, how are you going to accommodate um, those trades? How, how do you work them in? And then I put a note, you will need to include outdoor refrigeration, sealed dry storage, or a sink element to eliminate trips in and out. Because that's the thing too, once you're outside enjoying the space, you don't want to keep going in and out, in and out. You, If you could, you'd want to maximize it with everything in your outdoor kitchen so you can really maximize 
you, you know, the time you're spending with loved ones or connecting with nature. So those are just some general tips for the perfect outdoor kitchen space. Sort of talking about bathrooms a second. It's, um, it's a little, it's a lot to cover, but a little less to cover than the kitchens, a little more straightforward. Um, we talked about this idea of experience again, could if it's not for the eating and entertaining outside, perhaps it's this idea of sort of meditative, reflective rejuvenation, um, just really enjoying connecting with nature is what the bathroom would maybe more be for. It's more of a personal experience, not something maybe we're sharing with others. But let me show you a little sort of, uh, excuse me, let me show you a little video of some inspirational outdoor bathrooms to consider here. Okay. So the first thing you're going to want to think about when you're thinking about your outdoor bathroom is going to be the location that is of the utmost importance. Certainly you want that to be in the forefront of new construction. Um, if it's a remodel, it's a great idea to tap into existing plumbing off of perhaps a bathroom or a laundry space if it's possible. Might not be, but if it is, that's a great opportunity. Um, let's see. And you want to um, be sure you have um, exterior building materials that are spec that can handle this type of space and water and maybe prolonged exposure to dampness. You want to think about that too. Depending upon your exterior house materials, it's possible to place a waterproof liner underneath whatever that wall cladding is. Again, that would be helpful with the prolonged exposure to dampness that space could be experiencing um, if it's not in direct sunlight, even if it is in direct sunlight. Um, you could build the outdoor shower away from your home. That's an option too, but that would require a more significant budget, trenching your yard and basically plumbing something similar to an underground sprinkler unit almost is how you're going to get water further away from your house. So if you can tie into any existing plumbing, that's going to be helpful. I put this in here for inspiration. There is a local designer, but she's pretty well known. Her name is Lauren Lease, and this is from one of her former houses. It's a secret garden of sorts. It is this outdoor shower, the sort of little oasis she created uh, off of her master suite, and she was able to tie into some of that master bath plumbing. And she's moved a couple times since she did do this space, but she's always talked about um, in her social media and in her blogs how if she had an opportunity to have another another um, outdoor bath at any of her current residences, she, she'd love to, but hadn't had an opportunity. But it's just a nice, quiet, thoughtful moment. It's And it's nice too, it's just sort of very reflective. The um, the plumbing fixtures here, they're, they're nothing really crazy. They, they look sort of very utilitarian, sort of very industrial, very, very purposeful, nothing, nothing too, what's I'm looking at, too, too showy in fact, right? But it's just nice little private oasis she's created. So the outdoor bath, right? You want to think about that ideal, well-drained location. Um, think about outdoor shower plumbing. So just like our kitchen plumbing, it needs to be rated for the outdoors as well. You want to think about appropriate screening and the opportunity to place it in direct sunlight if possible. That's not a requirement. Like I said, it's just going to help with drying out and the prolonged exposure to dampness over time if you can place something more in a direct sunlight area. So a well-drained location, um, what does it sit on? It needs to be exposed to long periods of dampness we've talked about. It needs to be both rot and slip resistant and it could be um, a foundation with um, such as teak or stone or even porcelain veneers, those will all work. Drainage is the top priority and it needs to channel water away from your home's foundation. And depending upon where you live, a natural or direct garden drainage solution may be practical where the water just runs off naturally and sort of more slowing. 
this works really well where the soil has more of a sand content and less clay. So think of the beach or the lake house. Um, otherwise, you need to consider options like a dry well, a French drain, um, or a shower pan of sorts. So that is the first step is a well-drained location. Where is it? What does it look like? What's it going to be? Then I think you would be smart and wise if you thought about that outdoor plumbing. Um, it's not as expensive as you may think. It could be very basic with a cold shower only utilizing the water from a traditional garden hose. I mean, that's as basic as it gets um, and connecting to a shower head, or it could be more traditionally plumbed with hot and cold lines. Whatever you're doing, though, materials should be rated, though, for outdoor use and, again, must be winterized, especially if you have those temperatures that dip below the freezing mark. So just something to be mindful of. After you've got your well-drained location, you've got your plumbing, you've got privacy, right? So when we think about these outdoor shower, outdoor bath spaces, um, we typically think about finishes um, for privacy or screening, things like pressure treated woods like teak and cedar. They work really well for screening um, and partitions. Otherwise, we might be using PVC sort of clad materials. That could be a nice application too. But how are you gonna provide privacy for this oasis and space you're creating? So I think the idea of both the outdoor kitchen and the outdoor bathroom is to providing simple luxury at home. Um, I think a lot of folks sort of miss that where they haven't been hanging out with their friends or they haven't been traveling and how we can kind of give them that idea of experience and luxury in their homes by creating these outdoor kitchen spaces and these outdoor bath spaces, just giving them a little bit of a luxury outdoors in their own oasis. Let me see. So um, in summary, I just want to tell you this other little anecdote real quick. I was just saying, um, I remember when I was little, and perhaps you all experienced this too, um, if I wanted something that somebody else had, or I wanted to do something that somebody else did, uh, my mom would always say, you know, now Allie, you know, if Ashley jumped off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge? And I would sort of instinctively say, no, why would I jump off a bridge? Like, that's silly. That's stupid. Um, you say, well, why do you want to do what Ashley does? Or why do you want what Ashley wants? Um, and I kind of got it and I kind of let it, you know, go. But in this environment, I feel like your homeowner, your client, they want what the Ashleys of the world wants or their friends or, you know, things they see on TV or things they see in social media, you know, things they see in shelter magazines, things they see the TV shows, whatever it is. So they see folks having these wonderful, meaningful experiences outside and they want to be included in that. They want to know how they can make it theirs. They want to capture that moment in time at their home as well and make it special, make it authentic, make it theirs. Like I said, this idea of living luxury at home. And I think that you as designers, um, contractors, whatever you're doing, you're well equipped to give them that experience and, and help them with that. And it's really a great piece of the market we can all tap into and we can all help our clients sort of gain that experience. And um, so I just sort of put this at the end. This is uh, my little outdoor kitchen and bath sort of planning. So it just sort of covered um, some of the cooking points again. So this idea that the outdoor kitchen just, if nothing else, it's four zones. It can really be three, but it's four zones. It's cooking, prep, plating and garnishing, and the entertaining. And then the tips and considerations for the outdoor kitchen. We talked about some of those um, as well. And then the idea of um, the bath experience, why folks are asking for it, what it's coming from, and considerations when you're providing that to a homeowner as well. So the demand for that outdoor bath experience is recreating that spa-like getaway that um, a lot of people are not experiencing right now. Um, they're certainly experiencing maybe a more active lifestyle. You know, they're not going to the gym anymore. Perhaps they're working out at home in and around their yard or space. Um, keeping your home clean. You know, you can bathe pets and small children outside, outdoors. You can keep that stuff from coming inside. That inherent need for nature we talked about before and bringing the indoors outside, that's a really big theme. Also, we talked about the considerations. Um, place in an ideally well-drained location, use appropriate outdoor shower plumbing, um, appropriate screening for privacy, 
if you can place and direct sunlight, if at all possible, and tie into existing plumbing, if at all possible. That's going to save you money um, and expense in the long run. So there's just some, some general tips right there. And that's pretty much the end of my presentation, uh, but I would open it up, Deb, to um, questions comments we have, feedback, how, whatever we can answer. Okay, Allie. Well, thank you so much. You, you really shared a lot of great information. And yes, we do have questions. We do have comments. So I'm just going to jump right in because I know we have a tight schedule today. Okay. And so, so Ernie is asking, um, do, do you know of a good source for outdoor kitchen design? Is there a certification program available? You know, that is a fantastic question. And I wish I knew the answer to that. Debbie, maybe we could get <laughs> Um, a group, a something, a certification, right? Just like we have, you know, the uh, the certifications through NKBA. I don't know of an outdoor kitchen or bath one that exists. I think that's sort of next level and coming, but it would be great if something existed, but I don't know of one right now. That's a good question though. It is, it is a great idea. And I know that uh, we are actually offering when the guidelines come out, we have NKBA guidelines booklet, and it's going to include outdoor kitchen design information. Ooh. So thank you for that tip there, Paula. Thank you. And um, and then so just let me keep going here with Ernie, because he's wondering if there's a special CAD program to be used for outdoor kitchens. He's using 2020 right now. He doesn't know if there's an outdoor application with that. Okay, so Yes, let me and okay, so let me answer that. I think it's specific right to the cabinet lines uh, and vendors you're working with, right? So if they have the CAD files for their outdoor line, that would be really helpful, right? Otherwise, I think you have to know the spec book of whatever cabinet line you're working with and know the limitations and design it as such. I've experienced and encountered the same the same challenge. The, the cabinet lines that I work with, they're really good with updating their CAD files, but sadly, they don't have the CAD file for their outdoor cabinets. They'll say, we'll just use, you know, like a frameless cabinet or whatever to suffice, which is okay, in the short term, but does become a challenge if you're doing, you know, sink cutouts and, and grill cutouts. It's a real disservice. So I don't know if that is the idea shared by all CAD manufacturers, but at least the one I've experienced, that's been a challenge too. So I do draw it in 2020, but I don't actually have um, the exact outdoor CAD files. I think that's manufacturer to manufacturer what they're going to offer. Okay. There was a comment here from Nancy. Uh, she said, Nancy, Nancy's that, yes. Yep, has a 2020 catalog mm -hmm. and she oh, she's a dealer. Look at that. To be a dealer. Well, thank you for that, Nancy. So let me just keep going. Thank you, Allie. And uh, so Robin says she has a client that wants an outdoor fireplace so they could cook bread in it. Is there any? Are there any resources for finding guidelines for wood burning ovens mm. that you know of? So good question. Um, I would say. I, I would say that for the wood burning ovens, we would just work with our local vendors and trades that do our wood burning stoves because presumably they're doing indoor and exterior applications. So I think that might be a case by case basis depending upon where you live and what trades you're using. Does that make sense? Um, sure. I know they've helped us out sure. in the past. So, that sounds good. So uh, Chandra, Chanda, excuse me, is saying if, in the plating and garnishing slide, she said she saw a smoker grill but no ventilation. Was that because the roofed area has ventilation? A smoker grill, no ventilation. Was that, that, that was, was in one of your images that you showed? Okay. Well, so we have to go back. So, per, so I would assume that if it wasn't directly over the smoker, but was over the grill, perhaps next to the smoker that was capturing it. If there was a roof above it, I would assume that, I assume that's, that, that is what would have been taking place there. If there was some sort of roof structure above it. I'll okay. go back and look. That's a good question. I'll go back and look. Okay, great. Thank you. And then um, I know we've kind of touched on this, but Jonathan was asking about um, faucet brands and models you'd recommend for outdoor kitchens. Yeah. So I think I mentioned, I know Moen has a couple. I think that House of, I, well, I, shouldn't, I know the House of Roll group has, I believe some as well. You just need to see what they, because you know, House of Roll is like four or five brands. So you need to see which ones are appropriate, but I believe they have some too. Um, but I think I said, I've been having the best success. And what I've been doing is the folks that do the grills. So for example, like a Blaze or a Lynx or an Alfresco, I'm referencing them because Wolf doesn't do this, obviously. But um, 
those vendors, they just do really that outdoor grill and accessory application. And so they have the outdoor faucets and the cocktail stations and sinks that are more geared to entertain that come with the bells and whistles. So they come with like the integrated cutting boards and soap dispensers and places for your bottles and your liquor and ice cube storage and bottle openers. And they just, they're really thought out for that outdoor entertainment aspect. So I've been having a lot of success specking a sink and a faucet from the same company that I would get the grill from, right? So like a Blaze, a Lynx, Alfresco, those come to mind because I've used those frequently. Okay, great. And then Serena and Ernie were asking um, if it's possible to get a list of um, some of the outdoor products that you've shown today in the, in the images. Sure, um, I, can give, I can give that to you. Um, okay, is that possible? Perfect. Okay. Of course, I'd be, I'd be happy to distribute that. And then Magdalena is asking, um, have you ever used a high pressure laminate for the outdoor cabinets? And she also feels that stainless steel faucets are best for outdoor use. So she's asking about that high pressure laminate for outdoor cabinets. So I have to tell you candidly, I have not. I have not used a high pressure laminate. I have had a lot of experience with the stainless by way of the... Uh, what was I going to say the request of the homeowner, the client, the clients requested that. Um, I've done a lot of the the natural woods, like the teak stained or the cypress stained. That's sort of been in my wheelhouse, but that's also with the clientele here. That's not to say that someone's not using something somewhere else, but that's been my experience, particularly in um, the DC environment um, and the weather that that we have. Uh, but that's those are, those ones have held up very well. Uh, but I don't have experience using that outside now. Okay, and then there's a comment here from a person named Paula. She says, nature cast is awesome, and she's in Montana. So thank you for that. And, and then Carla was asking, because we we're touching on this right now. Uh, so what about HDPE or polymer outdoor cabinetry? She, she said that is huge right now. So, so it sounds like you don't have much... Well, the high, um, well, the, excuse me, it, the but... high, let me find my notes. No, so we've used, <clears throat> so usually, you? usually the box construction is that HP, PE, I want to say, we're talking about the same thing, the high, uh, I lost my note here, but the high polyethylene, I think sort of, so. I think that's what we're talking about. Polymer, polymer, yeah. Yes, exactly. So yes, I, I, that's typically been the box construction that I've used for the outside, um, but I haven't actually used that as the door cladding because one of the vendors I use, I don't think they offer what is the most attractive application of it, but they do have a line like that. And like I said, the box construction is that. Okay. Okay. That, that's helpful. Thank you. And then Taylor's asking, is quartzite an accepted outdoor kitchen material? So I feel like I would tell you yes, because it's natural stone, but I would say check with your fabricator, tell them where you're installing it and see what they say. Because I know that the soapstones and the granite, the soapstones and the granite, they're going to advise first, but it may be dependent on your climate, your region, that sort of thing. I would think if I had a quartzite, I should probably be able to use it if I'm using a granite or a soapstone, but I would say check with your fabricator. The other thing to check with your fabricator with on a side note, and I should have mentioned this, I forgot, is they will charge you more money depending upon the application if it's not necessarily right in your kitchen, right? They're accustomed to walking in, you know, it's X number of feet, X number of steps, here are the turns, here's this, here's that. When they get into things like rooftop decks or some patios or some decks, they may charge you more um, for installation, just depending upon the difficulty of access, how much more difficult it is in say a typical indoor kitchen, and they'll charge you accordingly. Okay. Mentioned that. that That's good to know. Thank you. And then Elaine was just, there was a comment and a question here from Elaine. So she said, recycled sales are great for awnings. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, they are. And purses too. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, good. And then she's, she's asking, and a couple people have asked this question. So how do you deal with rainwater and keeping it out of the septic system if there's no roof over the bath, the outdoor bath? Yeah. So I, I have done outdoor baths without a roof, but I have to tell you, I don't have an answer about the septic system that I don't have an answer on. I probably should, but I don't have a, I don't have a good answer for you on that. Okay. Where might they get an answer? Do you have any idea about mm, that? The contractor? I, th well, I think maybe your contractor, but I, I maybe the plumber, right? Okay. Probably the plumber who's 
doing your plumbing um, and then your exist your specific conditions, right? Because not, I, I, it's probably a case by case basis, um, but I would say, I would say check with your contractor and your plumber. Okay. And then thank you. And then Elaine is also saying here, local codes may mm -hmm. require a roof. So that's good. It depends. Know. Right. Yep. Yep. And then I have a final question here before we wrap, uh, Allie, and it's coming from Rachel and she would like to know the average cost of a crane. You talked about cranes earlier. Isn't that a good question? <laughs> um, mm, mm, it's up there. Usually you get them for like a four hour window and it's probably going to vary jurisdiction depending upon where you are. I want to tell you it costs not quite, but maybe shy of, of a thousand dollars possibly okay. um, for the operator, for the machine. There's a couple other things to it, but I think if I recall correctly, when we have used them, it's been a little less than like a thousand dollars per use per that time we've blocked them from. Okay. But again, that's what we've been using. It could be different everywhere, right? I just know that that's been our experience. It was that's a little good. less than $1,000 each sort of trip. And it, okay. and it was for a four-hour time block that you got it for. Oh, the other thing to mention about a crane, should have said this too, if you have any sort of wind condition, they will not bring it out. So if they're calling for like, you know, 15-mile-an-hour winds, I don't know, something to that effect, you're going you're gonna to have to you know, change your plans because they're not going to set up the crane under certain conditions. So you right. want to be mindful of that too. That could right. change your schedule. And I heard you mentioned blocking off streets and things like mm -hmm. that, especially if it's in an urban area. So that's, there's a lot of considerations for sure and how close you are to the next property, et cetera. Um, so I just wanted to add one more thing. Doris is saying uh, she had done an outdoor shower. She said it's fabulous. She said she would suggest having outlets and cushions. So have a place to relax after showering, to blow your hair, your kid's hair, and putting on makeup divine. <laughs> but, so no, that's fantastic. If you got space for that to include those amenities, that's awesome. Yes. Yes. Great. Well, I don't see any more questions and I know that you have a short window here, Allie. So I really appreciate everything that you've shared with us today and to all of you out in our audience to thank you for joining us. And once again, to thank Blaze Outdoor Products for their generous support for uh, sponsoring our webinars this month. Thank you, Allie. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. You too. Bye, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.